at 963 feet, with a gross weight of 69,053 tons, the Queen Elizabeth II is probably the most famous passenger ship in the world. Her spectacular profile in Southampton water as she arrives at her home port never fails to draw an audience. So it's perhaps not surprising that she's considered by many to be the last great liner. July 1967, the prefabricated keel was laid. 1,100 tons of aluminium were to be used in the liner's superstructure, much of which was prefabricated in the shipyard's workshops. Meanwhile, work continued on the steel hull. Unlike her predecessors, which were riveted, job number 736, as the new ship was then known, was constructed by welding her plates. The superstructure of lighter aluminium was eventually riveted to the steel structure with a layer of epoxy compound between the different metals to overcome the potential problem of corrosion. During the ensuing months, the giant structure of 736 took shape. 13 decks, the 27-foot rudder which weighs 70 tonnes, and three 278-tonne Foster Wheeler boilers. As the job progressed, the workforce rose to around 3,500. Captain William Warwick was appointed master designate of the new line. Newly painted and with her twin propellers fitted, the new Cunarda was ready to be launched by Her Majesty the Queen on the 20th of September, 1967. Despite the collapse of the transatlantic liner trade, Cunard was unwilling to admit defeat to the jet. Confronting bankruptcy and to the amazement of the skeptics, they built a new ship. A ship aimed at regaining the glory of Britain on the seas. In September 1967, tens of thousands of people gathered on the banks of the River Clyde to witness Queen Elizabeth II give her name to the third largest ocean liner built in Britain. A launch is a peculiar thing, right? because you're working with people who've maybe launched 200 boats in their career, and it's still got this peculiar, odd, kind of emotional feeling. And I think it's, it's got to do with the fact that you've worked on it, and the fact that for four years you have been building this structure and you've watched it grow. And it's absolutely stable. It does not move, it does not creak, it does nothing. And then after the ceremony, and the bottle of champagne smashed across the bows, there's about four seconds when nothing happens. And suddenly you just see this thing weighing 40,000 tons just moving and away it goes and it literally is a mountain moving. And it just turns into this great awe-inspiring event and it takes to the water and it's light and it's mobile and suddenly it's got a life of its own. February, models of the QE2's interior designs went on show to the public at the London After the launch, the new £30 million ship was immediately manoeuvred into the fitting out berth at Browns. And for the following 14 months, the completion of the floating hotel continued. Cables, plumbing, auxiliary machinery, carpets, tiling and fittings were all installed.
On the morning of the 19th of November 1968, the QE2 was ready to make her first short voyage from Clydebank to Greenock, a distance of around 10 miles. Thousands lined the river's banks and a special holiday was declared for the local residents. Aided by tugs, the colossal liner navigated the relatively narrow bends of the upper Clyde and made her way downriver at about six knots. On board, a special A few days later, on the 7th of May, the QE2 made her inaugural arrival in New York. She was enthusiastically welcomed by the city, and Mayor John Lindsay declared it Queen Elizabeth II Day. By September 1969, the QE2 had generated a profit of nearly 1.7 million pounds. She was, indisputably, a success.